jump straight into the next one. Uh, we have Gordon up. He's going to talk about acquiring water from subsurface. Right, that's true. Um, thrilled to be here. Um, I'm Gordon Wasilewski. I'm a fresh postgraduate in petroleum engineering and mining and geology, and I'm here to tell you what I know about water on Mars generally. Uh, but first things first, how on earth can Martian drilling help us? That was the question that Professor Alfred Oysters from Colorado School of Mines asked when he had a visiting lecture at my university in Poland. And um, that was three years ago. And up then, I was inspired by Martian exploration and space exploration, but you know, I was studying petroleum engineering, so where's the connection? But he told me that there's a true nexus between what I think that what, what inspires me, what, what's my knowledge, was where's, where, where my skills at, and uh, he made me completely change my mind about what's my future, actually. I think. And um, that lecture made me think and made me learn about this particular problem. And uh, after that, I paraphrased this question um, as my professor to how and why on earth should we drill for water on Mars? And that was a part of my master's thesis that I recently completed. Uh, actually, the problem of water on Mars is extremely complicated matter, but it shows best people's ability how to um, figure out complex phenomena out of uh, tiny little puzzles, actually. Obviously, I do not claim that we know everything there is to know about water on Mars, but right now, I think we know a bulk of it. And um, the questions that concern water cycle, water inventory, and past conditions on Mars are well, quite well understood right now, I think. And um, even though it's quite a difficult one because it concerns uh, geology and mineralogy, climate studies and analog studies, and also, and most of all, technology, the technological challenges that uh, we have to, um, to obtain those, those data. Um, but even though we can figure out uh, geological time frame of Mars from its surface features and in situ research, actually. Um, we can figure out complex data for uh, past climate studies, like here with the surface pressure. And um, we can ask questions about what was past Mars? Was it warm and wet, or was it cold and icy? We also have answers for questions uh, in uh, technology, uh, technology uh, things like with drilling and um, with, uh, with planetary drilling, you know, these challenges and problems, and uh, with uh, water inventory, actually. But water is what is fascinating me the most. Uh, and it's not liquid water, of course, on Mars. Uh, there is no certain evidence that we have stable, non-transient liquid water here on Mars today. There's just no conditions for it. But we can see that evidence for past periods of Martian history, for the Noachian and Hesperian periods with valley networks and outflow channels, for example. Um, and they shaped geomorphological features of the planet over, over the many years. However, today, um, what's on Mars is a domain of gas and solid phase, mainly. And uh, interactions between water vapor within the atmosphere and uh, um, in porous space and on uh, water ice found on the subsurface, surface, and dust grains within, within the air. And uh, these processes and the results are strongly obliquity driven, meaning that the spatial distribution of water changes um, with the different axial tilt of the planet. With today, obliquity, with today obliquity of 25, ice is um, stable in polar regions and on the surface, um, and generally stable below the surface in latitudes higher than 55 degrees, and also on polar facing slopes of lower latitudes. Uh, but when obliquity drops to around 15 degrees, uh, the whole atmosphere should collapse and condense in poles, 
when obliquity is higher than today with 35 degrees, there should be no polar ice caps. Uh, ice should be transferred to mid-latitudes, but with 45 degrees, ice should remain in equatorial regions and even on tropical mountains. Yeah, that's actually where ice is stable today. Um, and ice stability, diffusive equilibrium, regular breathing are actually key phrases with uh, concerning today uh, water on Mars. Um, ice is generated and degenerated through diffusive interactions uh, with the atmosphere in the process called regular breathing. Uh, spatially, we can model at which depth ice should be stable, which means that it's in equilibrium, um, meaning that there is no mass flux in or out. Ice would be in disequilibrium when it's either gaining or losing its mass. And uh, ice being generally stable at high latitudes is less prospective for human presence because it is harder to descend and ascend there. But we can hear more and more about ice being locally stable, or at least existing, at lower latitudes. And Sherrod's mapping of Western Utopia of Planitia uh, was uh, one of the examples of showing that water ice is shallow and abundant at latitudes lower than 55. And that made me thinking of how much, how much of it we can actually utilize. And we can acquire it through uh, sampling of small volumes for research or production of large volumes for human needs. Uh, sampling devices are usually sniffers, corers, or integrated equipment like um, honeybees with miswi, and they're represented here on the, on the left. Um, and their main task is to drill through the regolith, sublime ice, and catch water vapor in a cold trap. Uh, water production on Mars is, uh, on the other hand, um, different. It's what, what's after we drill a well, how to heat the regolith, obtain a sample, a stable phase change and bring water on surface, which quite closely today resembles operations or in oil and gas uh, production on Earth. And the main part of my analysis was to develop a ge geological model of the first 12 meters of the regolith, and it consists of parameters such as uh, density, porosity, pore filling fraction, ice, volumetric concentration, thermal inertia, conductivity, and specific heat. And uh, you can see boundaries here for the specific for the utopia of Indonesia uh, from, from research. And uh, afterwards, um, using a set of 13 drilling sampling devices that have or had um, technology readiness level at least five, I tried to evaluate relative efficiency for water sampling according to technical, sp uh, technical parameters of those devices. And uh, to do so, I decided to rank equipment with sampling efficiency factor epsilon. Uh, which stands for volume of sampled ice divided by power and mass of a sampling device. Um, the results were unexpected, actually, um, but I have decided to mid the highest ranked device, which was Micro Rosa, in favor of Autogoffer due to uncertainty of parameters of, of the former. That way, we could figure out that using existing and developing technologies, we can sample up to half a liter of waters uh, that's on average out of all these devices, uh, drilling up to the maximum reach of each device. But the last and most important um, evaluation focused on production technologies. And in fact, a lot of pattern cases uh, exist today for water production on Mars. And in order to simplify, we could um, merge them into two classes of heating method, which means that there's a beamed energy that you've seen earlier uh, that's applied on the surface and maybe either microwave or solar source and downhill energy that is applied inside a well and may have electrical, uh, thermal, microwave or solar source it's like here. But regardless of the method used and heating source applied, um, we can model heat transfers within the regolith and I've decided to create a two-dimensional conductive heat transfer model um, using console 5.1 and the geological model created earlier uh, have been recreated within the program and running calculations with uh, a delta of time for seven days. Uh, I could find the ice water vapor contact around uh, 200, which at Martian conditions is 273 Kelvin around isotherm. And that would indicate uh, a radius which all ice should have already sublimed 
uh, after those few days of heating. And um, heating scenarios that have been applied consist of constant temperatures applied on the whole Bruchel wall in case of downhill energy, and uh, um, constant temperatures applied on starting point of the model uh, in case of the beamed energy. And that way, we could volumetrically uh, estimate how much water exists below the surface after the heating, and that means what is the water in place, and how much actually we can recover, multiplying water in place with the recovery factor, which I assume to be 50%, because we don't know how much will it be. I mean, that's definitely not zero, and definitely not 100%, so 50% is quite fine. Uh, and on average, in both methods, we could, uh, on, out of a well of 30 centimeters in diameter, we could get uh, around three cubic meters of, of water, which is around three tons of water uh, in a, around a month uh, from a single well drill. That's quite a lot. And with Autogaffer already on board, I've decided to, um, to propose an architecture for acquisition uh, of water on Mars, which is based on wireline uh, devices. And um, uh, I think that both for sampling and, and, uh, and uh, water production, wireline would be uh, quite optimal. This lets us having a modular, multi-purpose device, which, uses, uh, um, which could be used both for research and water production. And we need a poly uh, mounted on a vehicle, like a hoverboard or rover and a two multiple use detachable devices for sampling and production. And the most important aim is to create a stable phase change. Uh, we can make that happen by setting ba basic rules of cooperation between the heating mechanism that provides uh, required temperature and uh, pumping valve mechanism that can stabilize pressure. And to do anything, uh, we have to mine at least the water phase diagram here. And by setting production mode to water vapor being produced, uh, basic water treatment is already in place. Uh, also, water vapor is easier to transport. It does not require additional collection device. But obviously, uh, that system in place, uh, we, with that system in place, we have to encounter a lot of problems. Uh, first of all, we have to start developing technologies because they're mostly patent cases. Uh, we still have to figure out how to effectively stabilize deep borehole walls without using casing or mud like we do in oil and gas here on Earth. And we have to figure out how depletion of resources influences mechanical stability of the regolith and uh, how it influences production, production recovery factor. And uh, we ha also have to figure out how convection, because those heat transfers were only conduction, how convection amplifies the results but it, it should probably amplify it a lot. So these uh, SMAs were quite conservative, I think. And uh, yeah, nevertheless, I think that water ice brings gigantic promise that our presence on Mars is possible and feasible, and it could be sustainable, I think. And with that, I, could, I would end, I think. Thank you kindly for your time. <laughs> I think it has been documented already the, uh, the presence of water, probably salty water, more seasonal. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, do you have any idea or do you, do you um, have to give us an idea how, how, how is that flow? I mean, how big it is, if it's a little creek or uh, it gets um, certain waves or how big is that? Well, we see that from, from the orbit actually. Uh, and so it's big enough to see from the orbit, but it's just, but we don't know the, um, the origin of it. We're not certain of the origin. It could be water. It could be what? Yeah, it's called gillies, for example. Yeah. Uh, it could be water, but, but it not necessarily has to be. Uh, but it just soaks. And it's probably, uh, if it's water, it's probably transient water. So it's not stable. It's, it's In the summer, they say. Yeah, yeah. And it on, it's only on the summer period. Yeah. But it must be big, because if it's seen from the yeah, yeah, orbit, yeah. it must be a yeah, yeah. amount. Yeah, yeah, but it's just soaking in a regolith. Yeah, this but that but that indicates that indicates that there's a lot of water ice over there, mm -hmm. and that's promising because we know where to look for it. Yeah, like in Everest, I mean, I've, I've been in base camp and I know that sometimes under the, the soil you find ice. Sometimes.
times. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like with Phoenix, we just landed on it. Just you know, with uh, with Rocket, we, we we blew up the first few layers of the regolith, and there was ice on it. Yeah. I mean, regarding the composition, do you have any idea what that water may have? Oh, that you know yeah, that's that's tough, actually. Huh? That's tough. Well, it, it could be perchlorate. Perchlorate. Yeah, yeah it could be perchlorate, could be uh, or just just brine, like a um, eutectic brine, like NaCl. Or it's just. A I'm thinking the sodium chloride because of the possibility of yeah. all oceans there, but yeah, that probably is not. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why don't you simply strip mine? Strip. Uh, you mean like um, with uh, digging a hole? You get a bulldozer, you just strip away all the legal that's on top, you pick up the soil that contains... Yeah, but that means that we require heavy machinery. Why yeah. Do you, why do you bother with the drilling step? Just strip the top soil off. Yeah, of course, but we require heavy machinery. It's it's what? heavy machinery. It's tough. It, it's heavy. Yeah. But this is quite quite lightweight. I mean, it's a, it's a drill, so it wouldn't weigh more than 100 kilograms. The whole system. Sorry. How much water would it produce under ideal conditions? I think that around three cubic meters, at least. Per day. But a week or month, it's it's hard to hard to hard to grasp in the mathematical model, but yeah. Best location, yeah. But you mean best with most eyes present? Well, it could be pole, but like any pole, so south or, or north. But um, yeah, it's harder to land there and harder to ascend from there. So that's why we have to look for somewhere closer to the equator. And Utopia Planitia is at 44 degrees uh, latitude north, 40. 45. Uh, so it's it's nearer the equator. So it's quite more promising than than uh, you know things um, in high latitudes. So, yeah. 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 About, about how big of an area around your borehole do you think that you can actually extract your stuff? It's uh, a number from 20 centimeters to 70 centimeters. Could be more, could be more. How much power do you need? Oh, that's that's another question. I mean, um, something that I completely committed because I just uh, decided to simplify it to how much energy we could have on a borehole wall. And it's either 300 Kelvin, uh, 350, 400, 450 with, with uh, down for energy. So just that's, um, I think that's doable with, I, I mean, I can imagine that we have an RTG heater that generates 27 degrees Celsius. I mean, obviously, it would do more than that. Uh, but yeah, with beam energy, that's actually what uh, uh, people um, were talking about earlier. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it could be a lot, you know, because definitely it has to fit within um, the borehole, which is, you know, um, have its its limits. So it, it has to fit, and uh, but I want to leave that to colleagues who who know more about, about RTGs or microwave heating. I'm just a, a you know, driller. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? Thank you.